Game Masters here, and we finally have our first look at Mordenkainen Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. Now, forgive the little bit of behind the scenes here of my library, uh, but I wanted to get this out as soon as I could with very little setup. Now, first thing to keep in mind is that this is currently only available as a gift pack, which is combined with... Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and a DM screen. Um, purchasing Monsters of the Multiverse alone will be possible on May 17th, but for now, as mentioned, the only way to get this is with the gift set. That all said, let's jump right in and check it out. So I think one of the first questions that most folks have is if... I already have Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and Xanathar's Guide. Is there a reason to get this gift set? Uh, I mean, a DM screen is a DM screen, and it's going to have plenty of good information in it, but it is, after all, just a DM screen. And as we understand it, Tasha's and Xanathar's has been updated with Errata, to make it uh, more current with the game and Wizards as of late has been on a task to remove insensitive content so most of the errata has been geared towards that. That said, come on gamers, we all know that we gotta have the latest and greatest book for D&D and really this is how that's gonna happen with this gift set. Besides, all you gotta do is sell off the Tasha's and Xanathar's books that are already in your collection and that justifies the cost. Now first thing, everything in this gift set has a metallic coating which will set it apart from other books and this is really cool but I know you guys want to see the innards of Monsters of the Multiverse so let's go ahead and dive into that. Monsters of the Multiverse clocks in at 288 pages and is broken down into two chapters. Chapter 1 covers fantastical races. 30 race options for your player characters. Uh, yep, official rules to allow you, the player, to play as a monster. We'll go over those in a moment. Chapter 2 covers the bestiary. Uh, monsters that, well, there's just over 250 monsters and NPCs that your players can battle and encounter. Then there is the appendix, and this covers a quick search allowing you to look up monster stat blocks by creature type, challenge rating, uh, or environment. Though, you guys know, when I do a first look, I like to check out the disclaimer. And this one reads... We asked the wizard Mordenkainen to write a humorous disclaimer for this book. We received this response. The day I start writing frivolous disclaimers for game manuals is the day I retire from wizardry and lose all self-respect. Mordenkainen's rival, wizard Tasha, apparently intercepted our request and sent us this note. Mordenkainen has lost his sense of humor somewhere between the city of Greyhawk and the Astral Plane. Keep your chins up, my dearest ones. The multiverse is filled with horrors, many of which are detailed in this book. Marshal your laughter and a few good spells. If we're going to be devoured, better to face the darkness with a smile. Okay, so in my brief overview of what Chapter 1 was, I talked about being able to play the 30 monster races as a character. Now, where this actually originated from was Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, in which wizards introduced the concept that racial stat bonuses have more or less ceased to exist as we know them. Now, it is more of a universal score increase with the following formula. You can now increase any given stat by two and a different one by one, or you can increase three different scores by one point. The only stipulation is that you cannot increase an ability score above 20. Now, savvy viewers probably paused the video when I was reading the disclaimer so that they could read the table of contents to view what all monster races were covered in chapter one, but I'm still going to go over them. You have the Aarakocra. Uh, it's a bird-type beast person thing. The Asimar, a humanoid with celestial features. 
Bugbears. Yeah, these guys are neither bug nor bear, but are actually cousins to hobgoblins and, well, goblins. Uh, centaur, part human, part horse. Changeling. Uh, these guys can shift their faces in appearance and voice, and it's rumored that they have elvish blood in their veins. Deep gnomes. Underdark gnomes that can live up to 500 years. Durgar. Dwarves from the Underdark, generally living up to 350 years. Eldrin, These guys are elves. Uh, we've seen them over in the wild beyond the witch light. Fairies. Uh, also from wild beyond the witch light book. Furbolg. Uh, cousins of giants with access to raw magic. Genesi. Uh, these hail from the elements of the material plane and their descendants of Jinn, Genie, Zafrit, and Merids. The Gith Yankee. Uh, originally closely held by mind flayers as captives, these are one that have escaped that hell and have honed their psychic powers. And then you have the Gith Ziri, uh, ancient cousins to the Gith Yankee. Um, these guys have honed their abilities to use psionic energy. goblins come on everyone knows what goblins are and i'd love to ask though not in my goblin voice i just can't pull that off that if you're enjoying this video please give it a thumbs up i'm told that it helps with the youtube algorithm and it also helps to put these videos in front of more people and i genuinely thank you kindly for that Goliaths, not quite giants but they do stand seven to eight feet tall and live in cold frigid areas Heron gone. Uh, these guys go way back in Dungeons and Dragons, but were included in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight book as a playable race. And then you have the Hobgoblins, and of course, if you can play as bugbears, you should be able to play as their cousin, the Hobgoblin, too. Kinku. These are one of my favorites. It's a raven type, also often found in the Shadowfell. Kobolds. Lots of players have been playing as kobolds over the years. Uh, they're fun, crafty, and they're related to dragons. What more could you ask for there? Lizard folk. Just that. Lizards that are almost like humans. Tall. Four arms. Or two arms. Two legs. The Minotaur. Part human, part bull. All muscle. Most of the time. Orcs, like goblins, we know what orcs are, only now we can officially play as one. Uh, the satyr, also found in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, these guys love to party. The sea elf, now this one is going to be an interesting one to play, and I can easily see a uniquely 100% underwater campaign being run featuring these guys as characters. The Shader Kai, another one of my favorites. Shader Kai are just sleek and <laughs> they're bad to the bone. The Shifter. Hmm. I, you know, I'm not really familiar with this one at all. Let's see. Uh, oh, okay. We're touched. So they're like werewolves, but could be a lycanthrope of different animal type, not just specific to wolves. Well, I like that. Uh, tabaxi, another player favorite, kind of loosely related to the Rakshasa. It's a cat of sorts. Tortle, old and always have a home on their back. And the Triton, you know, you could pair these up with that sea elf for a variety of character types for that underwater campaign adventure. The Yunti, uh, so I heard about these guys being in here. I've never really understood exactly how they'll be playable, but here they are. So you can see that we are on page 36, which most of the remaining pages cover the bestiary itself. Now, I'm almost willing to wager that while the monsters that are about to be portrayed, given the formula of what we've seen with playable monster races, I can't see that it would be terribly difficult to pick any of these and use them as well to play as characters. The key difference here is now we have actual stat blocks to help round them out, um, but also with a good bit of story and background uh, about what the creature is or monster is and what drives them to do what it is that they do. 
Now, one of the things that I had heard is that uh, Wizards of the Coast is trying to do away with demons and, and devils. There was a mighty, mighty uproar uh, when that rumor first came out. Uh, I want to say it was probably close to about uh, a year, maybe two years ago. But I want to look at this one, Baphomet. And looking at the stat block, I mean, it says right here, Demon. So I think that rumor, it's been dispelled. Now, this bestiary, I mean, the entire book really kind of plays out as a Monster Manual 2 because of their new formula for being able to play as monsters. Well, you know, you guys have heard me before say that a crafty DM can figure out a way to accomplish a task. I'm going to coin this now. Uh, I think that a crafty player could, again, easily pick any one of these monsters from the bestiary and really use them as a playable race uh you know using the same formula that tasha's book started and that monsters of the multiverse has continued now i want to examine one monster kind of up close and personal how about the Leviathan. So we've talked a little bit about an underwater campaign, and of course a Leviathan would fit perfectly into that. It has an armor class of 17, a strength of 27, uh, dex is 24, constitution is a whopping 30, intelligence is 2, really? 2? Wisdom is 18, and charisma is 17. It has a challenge rating of 20. It has a legendary resistance, much like the dragons and Fizzband's dragons, and this is kind of interesting. Uh, if it takes 50 cold damage or more in a turn, it partially freezes, reducing its movement. Of course, it can do double damage. Oh, and has a tidal attack. It creates a wave 250 feet long, 250 feet tall, and 50 feet wide. Wow. Uh, but it only does 7d12 damage, I'd think a wave of water would do a lot more damage than that. Oh, and hey, look, a devil. Hey, isn't that the cover of the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook? Now, one thing I want to see is... And I always look at look for this at the back of any monster book is zombies. So we've got Zar Zaratan, Zariel. Nope. No zombies. That might be kind of fun to play as a group of zombies, yeah? Okay, so last we have the appendix. And as mentioned at the top of this video, this is broken down so that you can search the stat blocks within by creature type, by challenge rating, and by environment. For me, I can easily see pulling from this the stat blocks by environment. I've always had a hard time trying to populate a variety of monster uh, across terrain. Usually it's been the same type. Uh, you'll find gnolls in the forest and not much else, or skeletons in a dungeon, or news in a dungeon, and not much else. Now, speaking of which, I do note that caverns and dungeons environments are not listed. Oh well. So that is our first look at the Morgan Canaan Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. I gotta admit, I'm pretty impressed with it. Glad I have it. And I'm excited to pull uh, some information from it and see exactly how my players use it when crafting up their playable monster characters. I'm curious to see exactly how they will play those characters. And in the coming days, I'll also go in depth on some of the other playable monsters that are in this book. And we'll cover some of the other monsters in a bit more depth. And we'll also go over the updates made in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, as well as the updates in Xanathar's. And we'll also cover the DM screen as well. Now, we mentioned the Wild Beyond the Witchlight a few times in this video. Uh, the Harrigan, Fairy, and Satyr are just a few of the elements that popped up in the Witchlight that are also in 
Morden Kanan's Monsters of the Multiverse. And if you'd like to check out more elements that connect the Witchlight book to the Monsters Multiverse, check out this video and let me know what else you spotted that crossed over. Aside from that, let me know in the comments below which characters from the multiverse you're most excited to play as. And until next our paths cross, may you traverse the multiverse in a Spelljammer ship. Wait. <laughs>